Hello and welcome to Showcase, Territory World's Arts and Culture Show, coming to you from our studios in Istanbul. On this episode, we'll speak to an ABBA biographer about the pop band's news of a reunion and show you an exhibition in Istanbul of rare paintings digitized, then brought to life. But first, Going Green with Style. An exhibition urges us to return to the roots of fashion. So what I'm interested in is, uh, is for Africa to be strong and to voice whatever it thinks uh, properly and proudly. And Africa rising. We're at the Dak Art Biennale in Senegal. It's the most important art event on the African continent. Now in its 13th edition, the Dakar Biennale is bigger and bolder than ever and is totally taking over Senegal's capital. Showcase's Miranda Addy scored an exclusive interview with this year's curator, Simon Jami. But first, let's see what she made of the Biennale's opening. It's a colourful start to Dakar here in Senegal with drummers and dancers both local and a group from Rwanda, which has a guest pavilion. The president and other dignitaries arrived here for the opening ceremony. It's taking place at the National Theatre. This is also home to the National Pavilions, while the international exhibition takes place over in the Ancien Palais. Now, there are two parts to the Dakar Biennale, in, which includes all these official sites, and off, 300 side events taking place across Dakar for the entirety of the exhibition. Many of the artists here believe that the Dakar Biennale is a mirror of Africa. And with 75 artists from the continent and the diaspora, this edition shows just how far they've come. The focus is very much on material and form, with huge installations and structures really lending themselves to the space. The theme this edition is the Red Hour. It's an expression borrowed from the Francophone Caribbean poet, Aimé Césaire. And earlier, I spoke to the one man most qualified to tell me, well, exactly what that means, the Biennale's curator, Simon Jamy. It's about time for us humans to make decision and to clean up the mess because it might be too late. Uh, so the Red Hour is this very moment where uh, whether we take the right decisions, whether we let things go and fall apart. It's a hugely varied programme on offer, and I know this is quite a difficult question, but what are some of your personal highlights? All the programmes are my personal highlights. Um, I like, of course, the, the Ancien Palais, where we are, and I like the proposition that were made by my five guest curators. I like this carte blanche that I gave to this uh, cultural centre from Cairo. I think the program is rich and what I try to tell to people is that nobody is forced to like everything. Everybody feels according to his own feeling, background, emotions, and that, that's the beauty of art. Too often I think we talk about Western art or European art, and perhaps now the tide has finally turned and people are really focusing on art coming out of Africa. What do you think? I think it's not really that they're focusing, it's like they're forced to see. Uh, I created, I think more than 20 years ago, a magazine dedicated to contemporary art. It was a time where people said it did not exist. Uh, it was a time where you would go to Venice and not see a single African. Well, we taught people. We need to talk, to, to, to teach people. They don't know. I mean, some of my friends would get mad. I wouldn't get mad for anything, but I would teach people. I mean, I don't mind people not selecting an African artist for something. I mind them pretending there's none. So we gave them the opportunity to see that there were many. And nowadays people like Ellen Atsui, William Kentred, etc., etc., are part of the top ten of international art. And now, if a curator wants to do something that he would call international without having an African there, is the one who would look stupid. So there's nothing I can do for stupid people. You've talked about your feeling of Africanness. You grew up in Europe, and I think you came to embrace your African culture and heritage sort of only in your early 20s. 
So I wanted to know, what does it mean to you to be here now, curating a Biennale in Africa? It means a lot. It means, first of all, that, uh, and it's always been my, my main focus, I want to talk to the world, starting by the Africans. I want them to understand that whatever they do, they have to do it good, and they had to do it according to their own standards. So what I'm interested in is, uh, is for Africa to be strong and to voice whatever it thinks uh, properly and proudly. I would love every president or anyone who wants to be president to come and be my, my intern. Because to make such a biennale, you need to work, you need to plan, you need to, to delegate, you need to have teamwork, you need youth and uh, all those things that are not necessarily uh, taken into account by the people who, who call themselves leaders of Africa. I mean, if you want to go somewhere, you need to define where you want to go and then find a way to go there. An artist always know where he wants to go. I'm not sure all the politicians really know where they want to go. So there's a message I want to, to give to Africa and uh, since I think that Everything starts with Africa. Whatever message I give to Africa will benefit the world. A little black dress, a formal dress shirt, a pair of denim jeans. They're sitting in our closets waiting to be worn. But have you ever thought of the environmental impact those simple items might have? An exhibition currently underway in London is trying to raise awareness of those issues and forge a closer link between the natural world and the clothes we wear. Nature has not only inspired the fashion industry, it's also been its major resource. But this has rarely been a two-way relationship, with fashion taking a lot more than it gives. Now an exhibition in London, dubbed Fashion from Nature, is showing just how much the whole industry relies on it, while offering solutions to promote sustainability. The real emphasis, the real spotlight of the exhibition is on, the, is on the complete dependence of fashion on the natural world for everything, for its raw materials, for water, uh, for the fossil fuels it requires for energy. But, so everything that we are wearing today and our ancestors, ancestors have worn comes from the planet we live on. Plant motifs, florals, animal patterns and natural colours. All the 300 pieces on display reflect how nature has impressed itself upon our attire. But some people in the industry say nature doesn't deserve to be stripped in return and that preserving it is in all of our best interests. We essentially emulate, we mimic the exact same way that nature creates pigments that you see in flowers and animals and fish and we use the same mechanism to produce our dyes using nothing other than, non, than renewable resources, meaning we avoid all the hazardous chemicals, we save water and we reduce the energy consumption of this uh, incredibly impactful industry. Some major companies have been supporting the use of recycled materials to prove sustainable, environmentally friendly fashion is possible. But in the age of consumerism, it mightn't just be up to them. So the more you, as a consumer, think about what choices you're making, whether you really need to buy another T-shirt that is potentially going to pollute um, or use so much water to be produced, um, I guess it's about thinking about other opportunities such as you know, buying vintage, buying less, but also just knowing really about how fashion is produced. I think that's mainly being aware of it and based on that making some maybe sometimes difficult choices but also good choices for the environment. You may believe that clothes make the man, but if you want to appreciate what makes the clothes, the exhibition runs until early next year at London's Victoria and Albert Museum. For more on sustainable fashion, I am joined from Berlin by Nina Lorenzen. She is the founder of Pink and Green and Fashion Changers. Thank you so much for joining me today, Nina. Now, to what extent is the fashion industry harmful to the environment? 
Well, first of all, hi, and thank you for having me. Um, well, there are a crazy numbers out there. Some say that the fashion industry is the second most polluting industry right after the oil industry, which is quite shopping, uh, shocking. But um, on the other hand, consumption is increasing, and so is the demand for fibers such as cotton and chemical fibers. And uh, so that all pollutes our air, our water, and our soil. So I would say that um, the fashion industry harms the environment uh, massively. And um, if we look at the supply chain of the textile industry, it's very complex. Most people are not aware of it, that fashion is not made in one place. So if we, for example, look at a pair of jeans, and at its life cycle, so from design to disposal, it travels up to 40,000 kilometers wow. uh, around the world. So those are crazy numbers. So what is the main reason that would prevent brands from becoming environmentally sustainable? Well, I guess the mere fact that they are not required by law. Um, so far, at least in Germany, there, is, there are no regulations, there are no law put in place that would require brands to act in a more sustainable and also social way. And I'd say as long as there are no laws, there's no need for them uh, to do that. And that's the uh, simple reason, because fast fashion is based uh, on a very easy formula, and that's profit profit over people and profit over our environment. And as long as there are no regulations, it's basically up to all these wonderful NGOs out there and to us consumers to keep up the pressure and to ask brands to actually produce in a fair and transparent way. Mm -hmm. Well, what about the consumers? Uh, how many people actually take the environment into consideration before making their purchases? Hmm. Well, there are surveys in Germany that show that m the majority of people, they do care about the way their clothes are made and they want fashion to be sustainable and social. And they are also aware of the fact that we can actually create an impact with our purchasing decisions. But then, you know, we look at the numbers and we see that consumption is increasing. Um, so we have this, what we call a um, awareness action gap. Um, so we are aware of the industry's grievances, but it doesn't ultimately um, affect our consumption habits um, because fashion is driven by emotions and it's impulse driven. And brands uh, know that. And you know what they do is they, uh, trick us into thinking we need to keep shopping in order to become happy and that shopping uh, makes us a better person. And I think uh, what could actually change is that if we start with ourselves and actually um, not let clothes define who we are, but rather enhance our character, character and align with our values. And I think if we begin to understand that happiness cannot come from things, then that would be a whole new game. There will indeed be a whole new game. Well, Nina, unfortunately, that's all the time we have left, but it was great having you on our show today. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Still to come on Showcase, Dreaming in Digital. when fine art and cutting edge technology come together to create something truly magical. And the return of ABBA. The Swedish pop legends are back with new music and a new tour. And now for a quick look at a few other stories that caught our eye. These artifacts are part of Iraq's illustrious heritage and history. And we are proud of our role in removing them from the black market in antiquities and returning them to their rightful owners. U.S. officials have returned more than 3,800 artifacts to Iraq 
that had been smuggled and shipped to a nationwide arts and crafts retailer. Among the items are 4,000-year-old cuneiform tablets and cylinder seals. The last time the U.S. repatriated cultural property to Iraq was in 2015. An exhibition has opened in Paris reflecting the historic events that took place in France during the May 1968 uprising. Posters, paintings, sculptures and films are on display documenting the work of artists involved in the protests. Earlier this week, students and workers took to the streets to demonstrate against French President Emmanuel Macron's labor reforms on the 50th anniversary of the uprising. And in New York, American entertainment company Live Nation has kicked off Concert Week with some of the biggest names in music. Bands including Foreigner, Three Doors Down and Paramore are scheduled to perform. During Concert Week, tickets are sold for just $20. The concerts are happening all through the summer, but the last days fans can purchase cheap tickets is Tuesday. This weekend, Istanbul offers you a chance to see something magical. A series of fine art paintings carefully selected from Zirat Bank's extensive collection of Turkish art have been transformed, almost animated you could say, into two unique displays. Showcases Carrie Alexandra went to see the results of months of painstaking work. It's unlike anything I've ever seen before. This is not an exhibition. It's a completely immersive experience. 16 stunning paintings of Istanbul brought to life and played out in a breathtakingly beautiful film above your head. You feel as if you're flying over the city as the seasons and scenes change around you. The Light and Colour Digital Exhibition is on display as part of Turkey's largest youth festival, an event planning to welcome more than a million young people over the course of five days, and hoping to inspire them with exhibits like Turkey's first 5K digital resolution show. The unusual partnership between traditional art and cutting-edge technology has produced striking results. This exhibition uh, is unique in terms of its technology. This is the first exhibition that uses 5K, 5,000 pixel uh, projection technology here in Turkey. The aim of the project is more than just showcasing exquisite art. It's about bringing it to a wider audience. By digitizing the collection, they've made more than 2,000 paintings available to anybody who wants to see them. Some pieces of this collection are exhibited in our museum in Ankara, but the people we reach is very limited. We always thought, uh, how can we increase the number of people uh, we reach? Then we came up with the idea of digital exhibition. At the same time, 150 people will be able to see this, this special movie made for this uh, ceiling of the doom. Uh, in total, 1,000 square meter digital screens were used for this project. A second room offers more contemporary images across an assortment of huge screens set to an original score. But what steals the show for me is seeing this extraordinary city and its people through the eyes of some of its most talented painters splashed across the heavens. Kerry Alexandra, TRT World, Istanbul. Their fans are saying gimme, 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 and they finally got what they want. ABBA are back together 35 years after their split. The Swedish Super Troopers announced last week that they had recorded two new songs and plan to take them on the road. Mama mia, does it show again?
The group called their reunion an unexpected consequence of their Avatar Tour project, in which they'll appear as computer-generated digital versions of themselves. The Avatar Tour is planned for 2019 and 2020. As for the pop band's new songs, one of them is called I Still Have Faith in You. They'll perform it as part of their virtual reunion in a TV special set for broadcast in December. ABBA fans are absolutely excited about the band's reunion and can't wait till their new songs are released. Now to speak about this big announcement, I'm joined from Stockholm by Carl Magnus Palm. He is an ABBA biographer and has written several books about the group, including From ABBA to Mamma Mia and Bright Lights to Dark Shadows, The Real Story of ABBA. Thank you so much for joining me today, Carl. Now, what does this reunion mean for all ABBA fans out there? Well, obviously, it's a, it's a, an amazing thing, you know, very, everyone's super excited. No one ever expected it to happen because uh, they've said so many times in interviews that they weren't interested in, in having a reunion. And for this to happen now is like a dream come true. I, I, don't, think it, I, I don't think it has sunk in properly uh, with most uh, ABBA fans yet. Mm -hmm. Well, tell me a bit about their legacy and why it was such a disappointment to see a band that sang the most groundbreaking songs of their time split up. Well, their legacy obviously is their amazing catalog of songs, you know, some of the best pop music ever made. Um, I think Abba's legacy is that their music made people happy. Even if they were sometimes sad songs, songs about people you know, breaking up or whatever. Uh, ABBA stands for happiness in the music, the joy of, of music. And of course, it was a, you know, a sad thing when they went, but you know, their time, their time was up. They had come full circle. It was time to stop ABBA and move on. Mm -hmm. So they have two new songs. What do we know about them so far? Well, uh, one of them is called, uh, I Still Have Faith in You. It's been described as a sort of melancholy ballad. It's in 6-8 time, for those who are knowledgeable about music. That's like a slow waltz almost. And the other one is called Don't Shut Me Down, which is said to be more up-tempo. Not exactly a disco song, but more, more up-tempo, more energetic perhaps. And, Do you um, think that... Yes, go ahead. Yeah, and... And uh, both girls are singing uh, on the song. So it's not like Agneta has a lead vocal or Frida has a lead vocal. They're singing together. So that's very, that's going to be very special. So do you think that these songs will be able to live up to their hits like Dancing Queen, which is one of my favorites, and Mamma Mia? Um, I think they will... The problem, of course, is that it's now been 35, 36 years since they released any new music. Uh, so how can they possibly live up to the expe expectations that have built up during that time? Um, I, you know, but on the other hand, it's going to be high quality. We know that Bjorn and Benny can write songs still because they have been, they have continued working together and have done some really great songs over the past decades. We know that Frida can sing because she records from time to time. We know that Agneta can sing because she also records from time to time. So it's going to be great. It's going to be good. It's going to sound like ABBA. But of course, those, those, the, the legacy, those major hits that we lived for for decades, it will be hard to match them. It will be hard to match them indeed. That's a great note to leave off at. Thank you so much for joining us today, Carl. It was great having you on our show. Well, that's it for this episode of Showcase. But before we say goodbye, let us head to China, where one tech company gave citizens of Gangzhou a Labor Day to remember. And make sure to visit our YouTube channel to check out more of our coverage of the global art scene. Until next time, I'm F. Dunhan. Bye for now.